name is Phil Simon. I've written a bunch of books. The most recent is Message Not Received, Why Business Communication is Broken and How to Fix It. And aside from being a really big Rush fan, I spent a lot of years inside organizations implementing different technologies. My first book is all about IT project failures. I do public speaking and still do a little bit of consulting. And I am a recovering email addict. I got to coordinate a couple of different uh, slides today, so if, uh, give me a weird look if something seems out of sync. But I'll be talking today about the new book and about why communication at work often doesn't work, pun intended. It's an, I think it's incredibly important. We live in this era of ubiquitous technology. Things are happening really quickly. And as I researched the book, I came to the realization that all this technology and data really didn't mean a hill of beans unless we understood it. Can you hear me in the back okay? We're good? Cool. Okay. Now, to me, communication is inherently personal. It's important for me to talk about what I am not. And first up, I am not omniscient. There's plenty about business and data and technology that I simply don't know. Nor am I the world's best communicator. I am not Dale Carnegie. I have gotten a lot better at communicating over the years. In fact, early on in my career, I would argue that I was challenged with communication and got some pretty tough feedback from people and made myself a better communicator. So when I see people who aren't communicating particularly well, I think, well, I'm not exceptional. If I can improve my skills, I fail to see why other people can't improve theirs. I'm also not always understood, even to this day. Sometimes I don't understand people, and sometimes they don't understand me. And that's just kind of reality these days. Nor am I the arbiter of what is or was not jargon. And to me, communication is really personal. The words that we use, the devices that we use. I'm an Apple guy. I understand that Microsoft is a big client here. That's why I didn't see a lot of Macs. It's not right or wrong, but it's a personal choice. The same thing with words. So I don't feel comfortable telling people, oh, this word is absolutely jargon, but this word is never jargon. And I often think back to a 1964 court ruling when Justice Potter Stewart was asked to rule on the definition of pornography. And he said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And to me, that kind of rings true when we're talking about jargon. And my first book is all about business communication and why it often fails. I found that I've kind of come full circle. And as we talk about big data, as we talk about social media and Twitter, it's downright confusing out there. So this need for simple and effective communication, I would argue, is stronger than ever. And we decided that instead of whining about it, I would write this book and go on basically a mission to simplify business communication. Now, if you spend more than five minutes with me, you'll know that I'm a big fan of quotes. And one of my favorites is from Jerry Seinfeld. Any Seinfeld fans out there? It wasn't in the show, but one of his routines, he mentions that we never should have put a man on the moon. Because now we can put a man on the moon, but we can't do something really simple like, I don't know, communicate well at work. And I feel like we could communicate a lot better if we embraced two things. One is simpler language, and the other one is new tools. In other words, not just email. Here's one of my other favorite quotes, and this one's right on the jacket of the book. It's a bit obscure, but I think it's apropos. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taken place. George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright and co-founder of the London School of Economics. It's very true. And later on, I'm going to cite some research that I uncovered for this book on our messages not being received. It wouldn't be as much of a problem if we understood that people didn't understand us. But often, it's the opposite problem. We have no idea that our messages are not being received. But it's very common for us to think that we are communicating effectively, yet as I'll talk about today, business communication is fundamentally broken. Next book prize, who are these guys? Walter White and uh, You got Walter White, big Breaking Bad fan. <laughs> Thanks. So biz business communication, I would argue, is, is fundamentally broken, which begs the question, why? Number one, we send way too much email. And number two, we use way too much jargon and confusing language. Now, I want to try a little bit of an experiment here, because this is my first time at Edelman. I'm digging the place. Very cool. Um, 
go ahead and everyone stand up for a minute. I'm going to try an experiment. <laughs> Think about how many unread messages you have right now in your inbox. Okay. Go ahead and have a seat if it's 25 or under. You guys are on top of your email. I'm impressed. I, I did this in San Jose last week, and we got a lot higher than 25, and people were still standing. What about 50? Anywhere from 26 to 49? OK, I got most of you. OK. For those of you still standing, do you have under 100? More than 100? Unread. I am afraid to ask. You can all have a seat. But I got most of you with 25. No. Email has become the default method of communication, and I don't think that it necessarily is the most effective one. But the problem is not email. It's funny, I had a few friends comment to me when I told them that I was having email issues with Google Apps. When my one friend Brian told me, you must have really ticked off the email gods, because <laughs> based on the new book, they're not letting you receive your messages. But as I would argue, the problem isn't email. The problem is how we use it. I'm old enough to remember getting my first email back in 90, 1992, and it was freaking amazing. I was a sophomore at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I went, wait a minute. I don't have to print out letters to send to my friends? This is unbelievable. When was the last time you ever described the word unbelievable as it pertained to an email? Probably never. <laughs> So why did email catch on? Why has it become the default means of communication? Why is it arguably the killer app of the internet era, along maybe with the browser? Well, first off, it's ubiquitous. Has anyone here ever received in the last decade a business card that did not contain someone's email address? I would be shocked. So everyone has it. It wouldn't have caught on so much if only some people were on it. In the book, I talk about network effects. The fact that everyone is on email, even if it isn't on the same server or the same protocol, makes it incredibly valuable. Second, convenience. If you think back to the late 1990s, you would have to go to the office to send an email or take out your laptop and dial in through a virtual private network or VPN. Well, guess what? We haven't had to do that for a long time now because we're all sporting these things. You've got five minutes at Starbucks online. Look around. People are checking their email. At least they're on their cell phones. So it's become incredibly convenient. Imagine if you just had to go upstairs to send someone a message. That friction would result in less communication. So this lack of friction isn't in and of itself a bad thing. It just explains why email is used so frequently. It's also incredibly cheap. I studied economics at Carnegie Mellon, and I tend to be very either cynical or realistic depending on your age. You get to a certain age and you realize that just about every answer in life comes down to money. Imagine if it cost you just one cent to send an email. Would it stop you from sending an important message to your boss? Unlikely. But if you send 150 emails a day and at the end of the month got a deduction on your paycheck for $30, you'd probably go, wow, I send a lot of emails. So email being free is one of the reasons that we send so much of it. It's also incredibly fast. We typically receive emails in what? Minutes, if not seconds? Imagine if it took even 10 minutes to send a critical message. You might think about that fax machine after all. Email is also incredibly reliable. Right? There are exceptions. I did have some emails that didn't reach their recipients. But that's the exception that proves the rule. I'd say 99.99% of all emails wind up getting to their recipients eventually. It's also very secure, the Sony hack notwithstanding. Right? The fact that those emails got out there just proves that, for the most part, emails don't wind up going public. Although it's happened to me, it's happened to everyone here, you've all replied to all when you meant to reply to just the person. Right? And perhaps best of all with email, it is asynchronous, which is just a fancy way of saying you and I don't have to be emailing each other at the same time for it to work, unlike the telephone. Forget voicemail for a moment. I can wake up at 3 in the morning, like I did today, and shoot Danielle a note that I'll be arriving around 3 PM. That does not wake her up. She does not need to be on email at that time. If she is, it's kind of scary. You've got more of a neurosis than I do. But the fact that it's asynchronous means that when it's convenient for us, we can send an email, and then two days later, you can check it when it's convenient for you. 
So there are benefits to email. I'm not anti-email. I love getting an email about booking me for a speaking gig, buying a bunch of my books, interviewing a rock star for Huffington Post or something. That's a good thing. But email has absolutely become a scourge. Any Dilbert fans out there? Okay, this pretty much sums up how I feel about email. So is the problem really with email? I would argue no, the problem is with how we use it. In general, we love to blame technology because technology can't blame us back. Oh, I get too many emails or power, you know, death by PowerPoint, we hear that all the time. In reality, there, those are very effective tools if we use them that way. You don't have to confuse people with 12 bullet points on a slide or inscrutable image that force people to squint. You can create an effective presentation on PowerPoint. Hopefully, this is one of them. The problem isn't the Indian so much as it is the arrow. Last book giveaway. What movie is this? Whoa. You each get a few pages? All right. What's the character's name? John Smales. There you go. Well done. Okay, no more books to give away, but plenty of obscure movie and music references, I can promise you that. So we spend a great deal of time at work sending and receiving and reading emails. Does anyone know how much time as a percentage? What percentage of the average person's day is spent in email? 70. Oh, 70. Not quite that bad. It's actually only 28. But I'm sure that there are people who spend 70% of their time in email. And again, it isn't necessarily a bad thing. Certain circumstances may warrant that. But I'd argue that it isn't usually the best way of communicating. In many cases, this represents three to four hours a day. Now, some of you may not believe that because think about it. Since most of you sat down with fewer than 25 emails in your inbox unread, my hunch is that you're checking email more than once a day. Either that or you should have written this book. So let's do some math. Any Simpsons fans out there? Last week's was brilliant. Duffman? Right, right. So this equation isn't going to make any sense to you right now. Right now. But I'm going to explain it. Let's say that we receive about 150 emails a day. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. And what if you spend 60 seconds responding to and reading each email? Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Well, if you do the math, that turns out to be about two and a half hours a day in email, which, if you think about it, represents about one quarter of the average workday. Again, these are rough numbers. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. Now, let's say that you don't think that's a problem. How else are you going to do it? You're not going to sit at a typewriter. You're not going to fax. You don't want to be in any more meetings. right? Here's the rub. Email is growing at 15% a year. So let's do some more math. If you haven't figured it out, I'm a data guy. Previous books I've written about big data. That number is only rising. Let's say that you only receive 100 emails in a day. So you get 100 now. And by 2020, you can expect to receive 200 in a day. And it's going to keep going from there. So something has to give. Either you have to put more hours into a day, which for some people isn't possible, or you're going to have to find a better way to communicate. And if you think about it, if you get even 100 emails a day, at 95% of the time you're on top of it, that means that 5% of the things are going to fall between the cracks. It's for this reason that Nick Bilton, who's a New York Times writer, and he also wrote Hatching Twitter, said that email is the most invasive form of communication yet devised. Has anyone read that book, Hatching Twitter, by the way? Fantastic book. Um, Twitter, as I'm going to talk about in a bit, has some major sort of cultural and communication issues. And Bilton's book really describes that. Now, some of you may not buy into this, right? Big deal. We send a lot of email. I'm a numbers person. How does this impact the bottom line? Well, as I discovered in the book, relying e on email so extensively is actually bad business. How bad? No more books to give away, but hopefully you're with me on this one. An email costs the US economy roughly $1 trillion a year, wasted. Now, that number may not have any context to you. That number is so big, it's roughly 25 times Uber's valuation. So 
so it's really big. In fact, McKinsey and company did a study and basically came up with that number. The U.S. economy in 2012 GDP was 15.4 trillion. So if you do some math, you're talking about maybe a six to seven percent savings. Most companies would kill for that kind of savings. Not to mention the impact on employees being overwhelmed, things falling through the cracks. Now, that's a big number, right? It's hard to conceptualize. Here's a specific example. By the way, who's with me on this movie? Oh, really? Pacino, De Niro? Heat. I am shocked. OK, it's a very good movie. Anyway, uh, this one company had an issue two years back and forth across the pond, as they say. Group was based in the UK. Group was based in the United States. And they would email back and forth over this data issue. Now, was it a complicated issue? Eh, kind of, sort of. But it should have taken two years. Go back to my Seinfeld quote. We can put a man on the moon, but it takes us more than two years to solve a data issue. That just doesn't make any sense to me. It turns out that once these parties got together for a meeting, that confusing data issue really wasn't so confusing. Oh, you meant this. I thought that you meant that. So this is just one example of email leading to, at the very least, um, a lot of frustrated people and two years wasted on a problem. And this begs the question, if email is so inefficient and at times even toxic, why do we rely on it so much? Why can't we get off the email train? And there are a bunch of different reasons, but at a high level, the answer is mostly human, not technology. There are better technologies, as I describe in the book, than email for many things. But there's always a reason not to do something. Um, as I study more and more about technology, I always go back to what I studied in grad school. I studied labor relations, used to work in corporate HR. Technology doesn't implement itself. We haven't reached the terminator age just yet. People make these decisions. We choose to respond to an email, even though we probably should have a phone conversation. We choose to copy bosses and get everyone involved, and then we have 75 responses later. The answer is human, not technological, particularly today because there are dozens of powerful alternatives left. They're actually very affordable. If you go back to the late 1990s, there were these uh, nascent knowledge bases and intranets, but they weren't very good and people didn't use them. These days, because of cloud computing, software as a service, open source technology, you can play with a tool like Smartsheet, like Slack, like Jammer, like Yive. Try it out for a day, a week, a month. See if you like it. And if you don't, you're not committed to it. You haven't spent a year uh, with consultants implementing it. You haven't signed a check for a million dollars on it. There are so many tools that are out there. This is absolutely not 1998. But we can't get off the email train. Why? We're just used to it. Let's say that you send 100 emails in a day, right? Five days a week. We'll give you two weeks vacation. That's 24,000 emails in a year. Most of us don't think about that because we're constantly doing it. I'm willing to bet that if you do something 24,000 times in a year, you get to be pretty good at it, right? We get to be used to it. Email is also very official. Companies don't really release internal memos anymore. Does anyone remember, I'm dating myself here, but intra-office memos? OK, better question for this group. Have you ever seen Mad Men? <laughs> That's the way that people used to communicate. And there's something official about an email, right? It's something. Uh, that's going to have some teeth, some staying power. You can print it out, right? You can say, here's the message from the company um, CEO or something. There's also absolutely a CYA component of it, right? Danielle and I can go to lunch, and let's say um, Danielle runs the company, or soon will, and I could say, you can't hire this person, or this is the worst idea, we should bounce this client, whatever. And in six months, I was right. It's been known to happen, usually about once a day. Well, where's my proof? Right? Hey, Danielle, we had that conversation. Well, maybe you don't remember it. Maybe you remember it differently. Maybe you won the lottery. So there's something, again, official. We can cover our asses when we use a bunch of emails. And again, thanks to smartphones, email is everywhere. If there were more friction, I guarantee you, we would send fewer emails. It's become, in a way, almost too easy, too convenient for us. Right? We don't have to log into VPNs. We don't have to go to the office. We are with email all the time. Americans only take about half of their allotted vacation time. And most people, when they're on vacation, if they're taking a picture to post to Facebook, oh, let me just check email. 
they don't want to come back from a week's vacation and have 600 messages in their inbox. So even when we're not at work, we're almost working. And there are more reasons in some cases. This is particularly true with many IT folks, Todd, of course, excluded. Many people fear personal interaction. We've all seen those skits, right, Saturday Night Live, right, the uh, squirrely IT guy or the movie Office Space, right? And I understand that because I, at one point, was an IT guy. And it's easier for me to craft an email in which I get the tone exactly right versus having a conversation and I go, oh, I really shouldn't have said that. But you can't take it back. With many people, we complain about email, but we secretly crave it. They've actually done studies on this. You get um, a rush of dopamine when you get a text message or when you get an email. It's actually kind of scary. This is why you're addicted to it. So we complain about email, but in, in reality, we feel like we're really important. Most people would rather get 100 emails and be copied on all of them because they're important than go, well, why wasn't I copied on this? Even if you weren't going to read it, the fact that you weren't copied on it often makes people upset. And many times there are cultural norms. I live in Las Vegas. There's a decent startup community. It's not Silicon Valley or Silicon Alley, but these are new companies that have embraced collaborative technologies. They don't have a history of email. Right? The management guru, Peter Drucker, once famously said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. These greenfield sites, these startups, can build their culture from day zero. They don't have to reverse decades of misuse over email. More mature companies have a tough time getting away from it. More reasons? Sometimes we're unaware of these new tools. right? We simply don't know. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Other times, we do know about them, but we're too lazy. And I face this almost every day. I abide by a three email rule. I will not schedule things over email. And with groups, don't even get me started. I'm not sending five emails back and forth. Tuesday at 6 doesn't work for me. How about Wednesday at 8? No, 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 no. Stop. There are many online tools that let people schedule. It's integrated with Google Calendar, in my case, or Outlook or whatever. It's got the privacy built in. So if it's open, then you can book what you like. And I've had people, in fact, there was a PR person at one company that I can't name. And that company does uh, collaboration software. And when I sent a note to the woman saying, all right, we've had a few emails back and forth. I'm politely invoking my three email rule, she wrote back, no time to look at this link, have to do this over email. And I could be a little snarky, so I responded with another final email. The irony here isn't lost on me. You're representing a company that's trying to minimize email, yet you will only correspond with me over email. <laughs> and then finally, sometimes we blame IT departments. right? Oh, IT just doesn't give us the tools that we need. Sometimes, sure, that's true. But in many instances, IT will give people tools and the people don't even use them. They only use email. I have spent a lot of time as a software consultant and a part of a lot of sales meetings. Invariably, if there's a new tool, the first question somebody asks on the client side is, how do I get this data into Excel? I have nothing against Excel. Excel is incredibly useful. But if you're IT, you can understand why you don't want to spend a lot of limited time and resources giving people a tool if they're not going to use it. Right? So if email were so effective, it wouldn't take so long to resolve these problems. But here's the rub. Email doesn't just result in confusion and understanding among big companies. It actually can happen with people who've known each other for a long time. If you didn't get heat, there's no way you're getting this one. Anyone know who these guys are? OK, very obscure. This is the English band Marillion, one of my very favorites. They've released 19 studio albums over a career that has spanned more than three decades. They've played thousands of shows together. And as Daniel said, I write for a number of prominent media outlets. I don't just write about tech. If I get to interview the drummer of Rush, or in this case, the keyboardist of Marillion, Mark Kelly, I'm happy to do it. So I'm talking to Mark, very nice guy, talented guy. And before we start talking about what the band is doing, and I can kind of um, geek out a bit, he says, tell me about your book, because his wife runs a PR firm over in the UK. It's interesting that you're talking about email because we've actually had issues in the band when the drummer, Ian Mosley, this guy, evidently ticked off a bunch of people. So they got on the phone with him and said, hey, what's wrong? We got your email. You seem really upset. He goes, I'm not upset at all. So if a band that has played thousands of shows together over 30 years can misunderstand each other over email, what does that say about a company of 300 employees or 3,000 employees? And oh, by the way, many of those employees are actually new. 
So this notion that we're being really clear in email is actually a false one. But don't just believe me. That's a single story about a very good band. In 2006, a couple researchers did a study. And they asked people if they thought they were being clear. Now, I'm actually very surprised that only 80% of the people said, irrespective of medium, yeah, I'm being clear. I haven't really met one in five people in my career who go flat out, yeah, I confuse people, <laughs> right? But 80%, right? So these researchers looked at this, and they looked at clarity when it comes to talking and clarity when it comes to email. And what were the results? Actually, a bit of a mixed bag. Around 75% of the time, people were able to pick up on tone, which, as we all know, is huge. Were you joking? Were you serious? Right? So 75% of the time, about three in four people got the message. The message was received. With email, though, not so much. Only about half the time were people able to pick up on the tone. So it was basically a coin flip. But that's not the worst part of the study. The worst part is that the people who were actually sending the message had no idea that others didn't receive it. Think back to that quote from before from George Bernard Shaw. This is why one of the reasons that I called the book Message Not Received. It's bad enough that people use jargon or send too much email. We don't even realize that people aren't getting the message. This is just a fancy way of saying that text-based communication provides the illusion of clarity, but it's a false one. And for that, I actually want to bring in my friends here, Key and Peel. Anyone watch that show? You may have seen this skit, but go ahead and uh, play the video. This illustrates that our messages really aren't being received. I'm trying to reach out to you all day. Are we on for tonight? Jeez. What? You can't catch me. You can't catch me. I want some more. Touchdown, bitch. What, boss? <laughs> oh, shoot. Keegan's been texting me. Sorry, dude. Missed your texts. I'm assuming we can meet at the bar. Whatever. I don't care. Sorry, dude, missed your texts. I assumed we'd meet at the bar. Whatever, I don't care. Whatever, I don't care. The f is his problem. Do you even want to hang out? Do you even want to hang out? Oh, let's consider. Like I said, whatever. Like I said, whatever? <laughs> this guy. Jesus, you are priceless. <laughs> You're the one who's priceless? <laughs> this one right here. Oh, you must. Oh, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. You want to go right now? Huh. Guess I could do that. Oh. Okay. Okay, let's go! You said okay. Okay, let's go! All right, you know what? You know what? You want to really do this now? Keegan, you nuts. You're putting me out. Yeah, let's do it! Oh, yeah! Asshole! First round's mine. Oh, no! Oh, no, there ain't gonna be no rounds, asshole! This is a street fight! This is a First round's mine, a beer and a good one. For my partner, right? <laughs> What's that? Uh, I, got, I, I got you a baseball bat with nails in it. <laughs> From my post apocalyptic Jackie Robinson costume, how did you know? <laughs> one of my favorite shows. But that's just not it. Email invites misunderstandings, but email also makes us dumb. Researching the book, I found that if you missed a night's sleep, your IQ would drop about 10 points. OK, I guess it makes sense. I certainly as, am not as intelligent today because I didn't sleep very much and I can feel it. But again, what, is, what, does, what does that mean, 10 points, right? There's no context. Smoking pot drops your IQ by four points. 
Who's with me on the picture? Thank you, Big Lebowski. Constantly checking email drops your IQ by 10 points. Now, think about it this way. You're better off coming to work high than you are constantly checking email. And I've got some more stats on that. But email also obscures relationships. Got another uh, video here. Todd, got one more video. Email can't tell us if there are actually things beneath the surface. Uh, Smartsheet, the company that's sponsoring this leg of the book tour, and I think is an Edelman client, creates a visualization. And you can see how people are actually interacting on a project. Your title may be project manager, but maybe the project manager isn't involved on key parts. Maybe some sort of analyst is actually what Seth Godin would call a linchpin, someone who just gets things done, someone who is absolutely indispensable. And with this software, you can actually see this much clearer than you could through email. In fact, I don't know how you would see that in email. And if you're one of the green people, is video going? OK. If you're one of the green people here, you can actually see how critical that person is to several parts of the globe or to the project. Think about that. Wouldn't you want that information if a business analyst making, I don't know, 75 grand a year came to you and said, I got an offer to go across the street for 90. You want to match it? Well, if you think, well, you know what, you're just a business analyst, we'll find another one. But what if you knew that that person was actually intricately involved in the organization? And Smartsheet's tool can actually show you that. Again, any tool is only as good as the people who use them. You can buy the best technology in the world if people don't put the time in and actually use it, then something like this doesn't become useful. Other effects of emailing too much, and then we'll get on to jargon. We become confused. We make it difficult to keep up with work, and the research bears this out. Something like 75% of Americans feel overwhelmed at work. They can't get to everything that they need, and it's worse in a lot of other countries. We also make it difficult to find key information. This is an interesting stat. Last time I checked, Google indexes about 30 trillion web pages. It's a big number. For those of you in the back, I don't know how many messages are in your inbox. It's nowhere near 30 trillion. And this has happened to everyone. We can't find what we need through email search. And we're using filters and folders and date ranges and uh, keywords and negative keywords, but we still can't find that key email. If it hasn't happened to you, I'll buy you a glass of wine later. It's happened to everyone. That doesn't mean that email search hasn't improved. It has, but we can't seem to find things because maybe we deleted it, maybe it's archived, maybe we're not searching for the right keyword. It's amazing to me how we can find essentially what we need over the World Wide Web in 0.2 seconds, yet oftentimes we can't find that key email. We also irritate customers and partners. Everyone's heard of Constant Contact? Researching the book, came across a study by Constant Contact. And they found that the single biggest reason that people unsubscribe from email list was, guess what? You send me too many emails. Right. We also lose focus. Again, if we are going back and forth, it can be very difficult for us to stay on topic. Here's some more interesting research. You'll get a kick out of this. Our attention spans are dropping in 2000 and I'm sorry, in 2000, the average American's attention span was about 13 seconds, according to the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Again, that has no context. What does it mean to you? That number has dropped to eight seconds as of 2013. Want to see something scary? The average goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. That's right. We are now trailing the goldfish. <laughs> this is why. Driving while texting is four times more dangerous than driving while drunk. At least when you're loaded, you're trying to focus. Right? <laughs> People think that, oh, I'm multitasking. No, you can't. Ask a neurologist. You can multi-change, but you can't multitask. And it typically takes you about five times longer to get back to your task and regain your attention. But people forget that because they're constantly checking email and text. Is it any surprise that things, again, fall between the cracks? But if I could fix email and put a cap on it or after invoke my three email rule throughout all of corporate America or even the world, I would not fix what's wrong with business communication. The other major problem is jargon. Right? 
And again, to some extent, we're all guilty of it. I think that the following quote ought to be on everyone's desk in the world. No less an authority than Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. These days, I would argue, jargon permeates the business world. And I'm going to show you some stats later. Because there's always been jargon. Right? There have always been, if you go back hundreds of years, people have complained about the evolution of language. There's a quote in the book from George Orwell in 1946 about how we choose the words that we use. He didn't like the direction in which language was going. This isn't just English teachers and grammarians. It's actually become, I think, very difficult for us to understand what people are talking about. Now, that's a bit of a broad statement. Let's look at some specifics here. Before I mention Nick Bilton in the book for, um, on Twitter, this is Twitter's, not mission statement, but vision statement from November 12, 2014. This is a complete mess. Now, I'm not going to make you count the characters, but does anyone know the limit for the number of characters in a tweet? 140. I figured you'd know that. This one contains 220 characters. 35 words, 62 syllables, four clauses, and two grammatical errors. And Doug, Dennis Berman is the Wall Street Journal business editor. So it's a little more than ironic that a company that prides itself on brevity can exp express what it's doing in a simple manner. Right. And oh, by the way, it's a publicly traded company worth about $30 billion, and people are a little doubtful that your valuation makes sense. So you probably want to explain yourself clearly. Now, I'm imagining that a lot of you here at Edelman work on press releases from time to time, right? All right. Here's a real doozy. And this one comes from Computer Science Corporation. They put out this monstrosity. The first sentence contains 61 words or 380 characters. It is an absolute mess with a completely contrived acronym of BDPAAS. Now, I've written books on big data, and I don't understand what this means when you put them all together. This is actually a grammatically correct sentence. That's not to say, though, that it makes any sense at all. It doesn't. True story, last year I went to a conference in Las Vegas, and I saw a guy from CSC, and he didn't know what was coming. So I went up to him and said, oh, yeah, you're here for about big data and the, the BDPAAS. Oh, yeah, you've heard of us. Yeah. Well, we do this and this and this. I go, uh, does anyone use it? What do you mean? Do you have any clients on it? And he kept equivocating, right? Well, what do you mean by client? Uh, stop. Does anyone use this? What do you think the answer was? Now, I don't know what everyone was thinking, but would you buy something if you didn't know what it did? My first book is about IT project failures, ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, and Customer Relationship Management, CRM. You're basically buying systems that do back office stuff, payroll, financial, supply chain, keeping track of customers. At a high level, you know what you're buying. Yet those products were plagued by a 60% failure rate. What do you think the failure rate's going to be if you don't know what you're buying? Probably not good. <laughs> Who's with me on this one? Uh, it's 40 eggs. 50 eggs. 50 eggs. 50 eggs. <laughs> what we have here is a failure of communicate. I think that's very much true. Again, think about the word communicate. At its core, it means to make common. Are some of the examples that I've shown you words that you would understand? I'm guessing the answer is no. Here's a company endorsement from Scott McNeely, who had founded Sun Microsystems. You don't define WAAS. The middleware, the right person, what are you talking about? And it's right on the front page of a company's website. This makes absolutely no sense. Why am I paying attention? I went to a conference last year, and I went as a member of the media. I wasn't speaking. And senior leadership, a couple of vice presidents, talked for about an hour. And they kept using a lot of acronyms that I hadn't heard of. So after about the 20th one or so, I raised my hand and said, what are X, Y, Z, and A, B, C? And I got a lot of puzzled looks from people in the audience. So the, the VP said, yeah, they're this and that, right? OK, fine. A couple hours later, I'm online for lunch, and a few people are pointing at me. I thought, uh-oh, I did something wrong. Not the first time. 
And the people said, oh, we were looking for you. You're the one who asked those questions about the acronyms. I said, yeah, are you with the media as well? What, what outlets do you write for? I said, no, we're employees at this company. <laughs> the only employees didn't understand what their leadership was talking about. What are the odds that you're going to be successful if you don't understand these things? Probably not great. But I could pick on executives all day long. Let's pick on some other people as well. This isn't just chief executives or marketers or management consultants. I'm going to go off on management consultants in a second. Even people who write and speak for a living are oftentimes terrible at making their messages clear. This is a guy by the name of Brian Solis, who wrote a book in 2011 called The End of Business as Usual. And he writes about the next work sending and receiving and theory and practice. And I remember reading this sentence, and I think it was page 70 of his book, and said, I'm done. I'm a pretty bright guy. I don't understand what the hell you're talking about. And my teacher isn't assigning this to me. This is a 44-word monstrosity of a sentence. It's absolutely terrible. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't be clear, right? One of my other favorite quotes from B.F. Skinner, the American psychologist and author. Oops, wrong slide. The real problem is not whether machines think, but whether men do. Very true. So this begs the question. Jargon's been around for a long time. Why is it so prevalent today? Well, I've got some theories. What are the usual suspects? Right? Anyone see this movie? Yes. One of my favorites. OK, first up, management consultants. There's this mythology that management is a science. It's complete hogwash. I could tell two companies in the same industry to follow the same strategy, and it'll work for company A, but it won't work for company B. Some companies ought to stick to their knitting, as Jim Collins would say. You need to focus on your core competencies. And other companies will diversify. Why do you think Google's launching cars and balloons to connect the internet and eyeglasses? Right? They're even working on curing aging and death. Those aren't really typical things of a search engine. Well, it might work for Google, it might not. But at the core of this is this belief that management is a science. It is not. Now, I understand why management consultants want it to appear that way, because if you're charging $300 an hour and you spend a year at some place, you can't give someone a very simple explanation that might work. You have to make it sound really complex. Well, where is the management analog? There isn't one. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere, and it freezes at zero degrees. That happens all the time. Can you say the same thing about the world of business? It's not that business is all fluffy, but it's a discipline. It's a social science. Management consultants want it to be an actual science, so they invent terms and they bastardize others. Right? They seem to justify those kinds of rates. So I can pick on management consultants all day, but that's just part of it. I'm sure most of you have heard of search engine optimization or SEO. Okay. Long story short, there is tremendous value at being at the top on, say, Google's results. In fact, around one third of all traffic goes to that top spot. And it drops after that. In fact, there's a really interesting uh, drop here from 10 to 11, which is just a visual way of showing to you that most people don't go to the second page. Now, for those of you who don't know, you can go into Google and change your default results from 10 to 100. You know how many people change their defaults? It's not a big number. In 1994, Microsoft did some research. And they collected Microsoft Word.ini files, basically the settings. And they had a couple hundred people send them in. Guess what percentage of people changed their default settings, whether it was autosave, whether it was your name, whether it was most frequently used files? Take a guess. What percentage? Three. Good guess. Three. Five. Most people don't check their defaults. How does this relate to jargon? Never before has there been more pressure to be at the top. And those of you familiar with the way that Google works, Google makes 95% of its revenue from those text ads that people buy. Right? They express intent. Oh, I'm looking for a speaker. Phil, would you like to buy an ad that puts you at the top? Sure, depends on the price, but yeah, that's, that'll work for me. Here's the problem. Paying for ads gets really expensive. Right? The other way is organic. Right? Well, if I make a product that competes with, say, Microsoft Excel, and it's just another spreadsheet, if I search for best spreadsheet programs, what do you think is going to come up number one? 
So I'm not going to call it a spreadsheet. I'm going to call it something else. Even though it's a terrible press release, that CSC memo that I just lambasted a few minutes ago actually makes sense. Because if you Google data platform as a service, you know what comes up? Last time I checked, at least for me, this company called Cloudant that IBM bought. Well, what if you made a next generation big data platform as a service? That has to be better, right? And if you're searching for that, then that would come up up top. So in a way, it makes sense because there's never been more stuff out there. We live in this era of big data for companies to use this much jargon, to try to change the conversation, to try to get people talking about their terms. I understand it. I don't agree with it, though. It winds up confusing people. But there are plenty of other reasons for jargon today. Some of us feel like we need to sound smart or important. Right? And at some point, I was talking about this a couple days ago with a friend. So yeah, um, when I was in college, the teacher said, you should use the biggest words possible. It made you appear more intelligently. Go back to Einstein's quote. It's not that you should avoid big words like polysyllabic. But if every word that you use is big, then you wind up confusing people. There's only so much we can process at a time. Remember, we're typically multitasking, or so we think. There's this fear of simplicity. Um, I'm amazed at how frequently people will say a word like use, which to me is totally fine. People will use leverage or they use utilize. Now, you can use whatever word you want. Like I said, I'm not the arbiter of what's jargon. But if you're using a lot of these complicated words, and then you get to something, and there isn't a simple substitute, you wind up overwhelming people. So I feel like many times there's this fear of simplicity. People can't go back, going back to the management consultants, spend a lot of time and money, and tell you something that's very simple. Also, in many organizations, there's a custom of jargon. You stick out if you speak simply and weird. Um, has anyone heard of Enron? It blew up about 10 years ago. Um, there's a great book called The Smartest Bo Guys in the Room, uh, co-authored by Bethany McLean. And inside the company, the, the top people, uh, guys like Ken, um, Jeff uh, Skilling and Kenneth Lay, would go to people and say, are we allowed to do this? Questionable accounting practices that ultimately sunk the company. And a lot of people would say, yeah, I'm not sure. No, you can't do that. Well, eventually, you'd go to someone who'd say, yeah, you can go do this. So it's very natural in organizations that, let's face it, are very hierarchical in nature to parrot the actions and even the words of top people. And if they use jargon, who's going to call bullshit on the CEO of the company? Right? Talk about cutting your throat. So many organizations, there's that custom of jargon. As I mentioned, there's just more stuff out there. We live in this era of big data. Here's a great stat from the previous book. The average person today is exposed to more information in a single day than his or her counterpart was over an entire lifetime in the 15th century. Great stat. In 1972, the average person saw 500 messages in a day, marketing. You know what that number is today? 5,000. It has increased by an order of magnitude. So we are just getting bombarded with stuff. And I would argue that one of the ways to make your message stand out more is simply to be clear. Change is happening faster than ever. There's a great graphic in the book I put in there about how it took something like 50 years for a quarter of the American population to adopt a radio. And it was something like 25 years for a television, and 10 years for the internet, and five years for smartphones. Things are going from basically anonymous to ubiquitous overnight. Two years ago, I never heard of Uber. Now it seems like that's all anyone ever talks about. Things are happening faster than ever. It's, a, it's affecting how we're really living and working. And most important, I would argue, we're often oblivious to its effects. People don't understand what jargon does. There, in 2010, a couple of Swiss researchers conducted a study. And they showed that people who used a lot of legalese and business speak were actually viewed as less trustworthy, less credible by their audience. Now, here's the ironic part of the study. The authors of the paper argued that we need to embrace linguistic concreteness. <laughs> you need to be more linguistically concrete. Oh, all right. So what, right? We use a lot of jargon. What's the big deal? Well, what are the effects of this? As I mentioned before, it erodes credibility and trust. We don't trust people if they seem to be talking at us. And there are many times in which people will actually not be clear on purpose. I had this conversation a couple of, um, I spoke last week in uh, San Jose. And a woman came up to me afterward and said, you know, people use jargon in some cases because they don't want to be clear. Absolutely right. A few years ago, I did some work for a prominent bank. 
and I tried to get a clear answer on something, and the guy would never give me one. I knew exactly what he was doing. Because if he ever told me something, or worse yet, put it in an email that I could frame, and he was wrong, or I should have done something differently, then I could go, well, you told me to do this. So some people know exactly what they're doing. I tend to think that those people aren't terribly credible. It often confuses employees. I mentioned that constant contact study. Um, if you don't understand something, are you likely to blow it off, or are you likely to maybe do some research on it? I think the answer is it depends. There's no doubt in my mind that it causes, in many cases, lost sales. If you don't know what you're buying, what are the odds that you're going to buy it? I think that's incredibly risky. There's something to be said for simplicity, and many times, salespeople and marketers, I understand what they're doing. They're trying to sell stuff, but by not being clear, they're not really helping matters very much. I've seen, personally, projects fail because of bad communication whether it was a website that was launching or it was a multi-million dollar IT project with an organization, people not communicating clearly absolutely affects the bottom line. Decreased clarity, what do you need me to do? Who can answer that question? Now sometimes it won't be laid out. There won't necessarily be a 10 point plan, but we've all heard people speak about thinking outside the box and synergies and all this stuff as it's a grand revelation, but they're just really talking without speaking. It's really tough for people underneath them to understand what they're supposed to do. All right, so let's say I've convinced you. We use too much email, we use too much jargon. How do we start communicating better at work? Like I said, if I can improve my communication skills, I'm not exceptional. I don't see why many people can't as well. Here's my disclaimer, though. Clear communication guarantees zilch. Does anyone here play blackjack? OK. Does anyone here know the rules? What do I do? This is me, 11. Hit and? Smile. Smile. Double down. Any day of the week and twice on Sunday. The last time I played blackjack, this was my hand. Now, I like to gamble, but I try not to do it very much because I have a little bit of a problem. Unfortunately, I live in Las Vegas, and you have to gamble at least once a year. It's the law. So I doubled down on 11. And guess what? I drew a 4 at 15, dealer flips over 5, 20, boom, boom, I lost. Now, I would make that bet any time. But clear communication guarantees absolutely nothing. Right? It increases your chances, though, of actually having good things happen. One more note. Sometimes the best move isn't PowerPoint or isn't email. Sometimes it's good old-fashioned talking. Has anyone read the Brad Stone book, The Everything Store, about Amazon? Check it out. Fantastic book. Amazon, they're not too far from here, right? No, the building. Perfect. If you read Brad Stone's book, it's absolutely fascinating because Amazon is a very opaque company. They don't break out Kindle sales. They don't break out sales on Amazon Web Services, AWS. People think it's five, six billion dollars. They won't tell you how many Prime memberships they've sold. This actually really irritates people who are trying to invest in the stock. They don't know the numbers. But there's a great nugget from Stone's book. And at senior meetings in Amazon, Bezos has banned PowerPoint. He thinks it inhibits deep thought. Now, I would argue that you can give an effective presentation. Hopefully, this is one of them. But at senior meetings for up to 30 minutes, executives sit in silence and read up to six page memos written in just, say, Microsoft Word, on a new strategy, on a new product, on a new direction. So this notion that you're getting bits of information from people all the time and you could somehow synthesize it is often tough. Sometimes it's important to sit and think deeply. Um, has anyone read the book uh, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi? It's called Flow. It's about the psychology of deep thought. He did a ton of research looking at athletes, artists, employees, when they did their best work. Guess what? They didn't do their best work when they were constantly checking email or constantly checking text. They did it when they could, for a sustained period of time, basically shut out the world and get work done. So there's a lot to be said, in some cases, for embracing new tools, but in some cases, embracing old tools like the telephone. So here are just six tips here. Look for communication canaries in a coal mine. I mentioned before that PR firm I was talking about. It didn't work out. They didn't want to sponsor the book tour. That's fine. But guess what? I would rather know that before I show up and I can't get in touch with the person and I can't find the place so the door's locked or the books haven't arrived and my only recourse is to send an email? That doesn't make any sense to me. I would actually ban urgent emails. I don't, if it's really urgent, why aren't you picking up the phone? It's also important to avoid 
the curse of knowledge. For those of you not familiar with it, you spend a lot of time at your job, whatever it may be, and because of that, you know certain things. That doesn't mean that other people know them. It doesn't come from a bad place. It doesn't mean that we're trying to be arrogant. It happens to everyone. As I mentioned, I'm not perfect when it comes to communication. I had a speaking gig a couple of weeks ago, and I asked the guy ahead of time, would you like to see the galley of the book? And he said, what's a galley? My bad. He's not a writer. He's an IT guy. A galley is just the PDF that becomes the printed book that some of you want. He didn't know that. So again, it's curse of knowledge. It's the fact that I know what a galley is. My author friends knows, know what a galley is. My publisher knows what a galley is, but not everyone does. So it's important to avoid that. Ask yourself, do other people know what I know? Would it be really difficult to clearly define your terms? Sometimes it takes just a second. I talked before about SEO, search engine optimization. How long does it take to say the word search engine optimization and offer a two-sentence definition of it? Not that hard. And if you can't, you should really work on it. Many people don't know what you know. That doesn't mean that you always have to start from ground zero. In the book, there's a story of a couple years ago, I was on a project with a guy who had a very in-depth knowledge of a particular application and we're in the middle of implementing the system. It's a very tough problem and it required very deep knowledge. But both of us had it, so we weren't really using jargon. We were talking about things at a level that 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet wouldn't have begun to understand, but we know what we're doing. And when we're talking to people in general, I feel like often that's forgotten. It doesn't take very long to clearly define your terms. And let's say that 90% of your audience already knows them. What's the harm in refreshing it? When I was at that conference and I asked the question, what do those two acronyms mean? I know I wasn't the only person who had that question. Why? Because a few people pointed me out and said, thank you for asking it. I think that it's important to save your syllables. You will get to a point at which there's no other way to say it other than the acronym. But search engine optimization, that doesn't exactly flow off the tongue. But if you're saving your syllables and you throw out a, a sophisticated term, you haven't overwhelmed people because you use words like leverage or utilize as opposed to use. I don't engage in email conversations. I told you before about my three email rule. A lot is lost if you don't believe me or the researchers believe Key and Peel. A lot is lost with text-based communication. I feel like it's much more efficient for me to have a conversation with someone than to engage in it over email. I can't even follow email threads with 30 or 40 people. Even if I could, I wouldn't want to. And then finally, and we'll take some questions, remember that the word communicate means to make common. People forget that. Not everyone knows what you know. Why not make it common? Most people, I think, will at least follow it if you can explain it simply. So those are just some of the tips from the book. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Here's how you find me online. And I think we have time for some questions. Uh, the question was about Marshall McLuhan. And for those of you who don't know, he famously said, he's actually in the book, the medium is the message. I challenge you to find five words on communications that have had such an impact. People have written books about those five words. Uh, long story short, I think he's right. If I'm tweeting at you, that gives off sort of a vibe, right? I wouldn't necessarily want to tweet something really confidential to you, though people, trust me, have done it. If I'm sending an email, Right? That has a certain connotation to it. Uh, last week I spoke and a person asked me a question about fonts. Right? If it's in bold and red with exclamation points, it can be you are the coolest person on earth. And initially you're going to be a bit taken aback by that. So in short, I think he's right. And it's funny because all communication is contextual. And it's always been that way. There's a book I quote in Message Not Received by Dennis Barron called The Better Pencil. Right? And it's so funny to me how people will criticize millennials because they're on Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook, and our parents weren't. Right? So they're bad and we're good. So misplaced. You know why our parents weren't on Facebook or Instagram? Because they didn't have Facebook or Instagram. The technology wasn't around. Stephen B. Johnson calls it the adjacent possible. Even if you conceived of it, there was no way to do it because the technology has an advance at that point. So we have to decide if we're going to cram everything into an email or if we say, you know what, maybe I shouldn't do this over email. Maybe I should pick up the phone. Maybe a direct message on Twitter is sufficient. Look, I don't, I'm not anti-email. Do you think I want people to re call me up and say, OK, Phil, the file is at HTTP, right, <laughs> for, colon, forward slash, forward slash, Dropbox, blah, blah, blah. Oh, send me the email, right? But scheduling or setting up a trip or a meeting, I think that's completely ridiculous. So short answer is I think that he's right. But if you go back to Barron's book, people have complained for centuries about communication. People complain now about texting. Let's go back. Plato 
hated the idea of books. Why? Because we should be able to tell stories. And if you codify something in a book, you lose the ability to tell that story and to answer questions. When the typewriter was invented, people hated it. Why? Because if you used to write letters, I could tell from your script if it had a personal touch. And typewriters were loud. Right? Well, people hate communicate. People, whatever comes next, communication-wise, people will hate for whatever reason. Now, there are more options, and you could argue that it's more confusing than ever. And certainly, for email, there are times in which you may want to put that in there. But other times, I mean, the Sony hack aside, why make whatever jokes you want about the president. You probably don't want to put them in email. right? What, what do you think hackers are going to look for? So I, I think he's right. There are many ways to communicate. And in the book, I got a nice review from the Chicago Tribune. And the guy said, there, there is no listicle here, right? No BuzzFeed top 10 ways to communicate, although that, that's the kind of stuff that plays, so I have to adapt it. In this book, and kind of the message here is, is think about what you're doing and how you're doing it, right? The default method shouldn't be email necessarily. Again, email isn't necessarily bad. There's nothing wrong with stopping an email thread. There's nothing wrong with asking someone, I don't understand what you're saying. Could you please explain it to me? I had this discussion a while back, um, very recently in fact, a guy was telling me all about his company's new products and services. And he was talking about multi-tenancy and cloud computing and hybrid clouds. And I understand where all that, all that is. I said, stop. I'm a six-year-old. I know nothing about technology. Why do I care? You want to bring, I was talking about this with Daniel before, you want to bring people in through stories. Why do you think Malcolm Gladwell is in every airport in, if not the country, in the world? Some people would question his science, and I'm actually among them. If you read his last book, David and Goliath, he talks about how a lawyer with dyslexia overcame that to become very successful. Right? Now, I don't have kids, but I, if I do, I don't want my son or daughter to have dyslexia. That doesn't mean that you can't overcome it. So his science is very sketchy, and plenty of people feel that way. But no one can dispute the fact that Malcolm Gladwell weaves a good yarn. He tells a good story. And the story shouldn't lead, another point I make in the book, with all of the um, features, right? What about the benefits? Tell me a story. Then maybe, oh, how does that actually happen? Well, we do that through cloud computing and blah, blah, blah. But so often when I read these terrible press releases, and I was just picking on CSC, I could have picked on 100 other software vendors, but they think that it's almost this contest to drop as many buzzwords as possible. And they, I honestly believe, forget the fact that there's a person on the other end who's trying to make sense of that, or in all likelihood, doesn't care. Any other questions? Yes. It's funny. Um, I think they can help, but you have to have that relationship with someone. someone. Look at Key and Peele. Someone may think that that's actually insulting. I think that's a way of softening it, but you want to have that relationship with someone. It's why I, I'm not too big on these rules. I will break my, I even write in the book, I will break my three email rules sometime. If it's a 75-year-old person who's not too internet savvy and has just figured out email, I know that if I send my mom to some crazy scheduling link, it's going to overwhelm her. So I will break that rule. I think they can help, but you probably want to have that relationship with the person because you may send an email with an emoji to a new CEO who doesn't know you from Adam. He goes, who is this unprofessional person, right? But you and Danielle might be really tight and go to lunch, and that for you, that's appropriate. So I, I don't like these rules, if, that, if this, then that, all the time, because I do think that a lot of it's um, contextual. Yes? I'll see you and raise you. Um, there is um, a friend of mine, I actually mentioned him in this book as well. I'll come back to that. But the second I think I met him, I wrote about his company in the third book. And he talked about, forget within the country, he talked about internationally. And his company developed collaboration software. My third book is called The New Small. It's about small businesses doing cool things with emerging technologies. And he mentioned to me, because he'd outsourced the development of a lot of the work to India. And they used to have phone calls. And they'd say, we need the product to do x, y, and z. And they'd say, OK, OK. And six months later, they hadn't made any progress. So, so they finally got on a video Skype. And they said, we needed to do these things. And they'd say, OK. 
So you're saying okay, but I don't really believe you. Why is that? Well, it turns out that in India, if you speak English and you, and you say okay, it doesn't mean I understand. It means I heard you. Two very different things. So that is the type of thing that winds up getting lost. Um, I do think that there's the potential. I mean, look, there's a double standard. Are you f following the uh, Ellen Powell lawsuit right now with Kleiner Perkins? And so you can make the argument that there is a double standard. And I, I don't really address gender in the book. It's not really ex an expertise of mine. I do know that if you're tough talking and a guy, you're seen as a leader. And often you're seen as a bitch if you're a woman. That's probably um, a bigger apple than I could bite off. But think of, I, it, in, in theory, it shouldn't matter. But it would be very idealistic me to say, oh, well, it should always be the message. So that's nonsense, right? I remember one of my first corporate jobs, and I had this vice president who was really powerful inside the organization. I worked at Merck and Company, Fortune 50 company. Huge tradition, incredibly strong culture. Of the first 100 companies on the New York Stock Exchange, nine are around. Merck is one of them. So a really successful, really strong culture. And a VP there could get away with things I couldn't even dream. He could walk in, put his feet up on the CEO's desk, and start hammering away. But because of his place in the organization, if I tried anywhere near that, I'd be out on my ass. So different rules apply to different people. And I wish that it were as simple as, as you say. Just, it's just the message. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, hopefully, you're finding people who appreciate what you bring to the table. I have this all-encompassing theory of the world. And people fall into th uh, three groups. And I only want to work with two of them. The first, people that get it. I love those people. It's not even work. It's fun. Right? So love people who get it. The second group, people who don't get it but want to get it. I moved to Vegas three and a half years ago and bought a house. It had land. I never had land before. I, didn't know, I know a ton about technology, publishing, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know how to mow my lawn. And I told my um, real, um, landscaper, who was about 52 years old, when I found him on the internet, his website was terrible. Designed in 1998, hadn't been updated, and it looked like it. I said, Jeff, knock a couple bucks off the price. I'll build you a kick-ass, responsive WordPress site. It'll look so much better than what you have now. No problem. He'd come over to fix something with the palm tree or something, and he'd have a WordPress book. And he'd say, Phil, I was reading this, and can you show me again how to embed a YouTube video in the sidebar? I love that question. He wants to learn. Love working with those people. I try to avoid the third group, those that don't get it and don't want to get it. It's just not worth it to me. So if you have those kind of people, you may want to get rid of them or not hire them in the first place. But there are always going to be people who could find fault. And you know, like you said, he said before, the medium is the message. The fact that it's on email and you want to make it official is going to invite criticism. I write for Wired Magazine. They get a lot of hits. I'm amazed that when I look at the comments, how many people think that I'm a complete idiot. Right, right. I, I'm curious. Right, I'm curious at how stupid I am. Right, you never want you never want to engage the trolls, but b these are people who would never come up to me and say you suck, you're an idiot, you got it all wrong. Right, but because they're anonymous on the internet, so they can do that. So you're never going to overcome everyone. Um, I'd say if you can find the people who get it, you're off to a good start. But it's it's tough because the, the Constitution doesn't exist in the workplace. Right, we don't have freedom of speech. So sometimes you can get in trouble. Sometimes you have to bite your tongue. And, and I've gotten myself in trouble. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question? Is there another question? I have a question. Yes. Uh, so you've talked a lot about the frequency of email. And I'm curious, uh, with big data and especially wearables, companies can now tap in and see geographically where their customers are and use that information to send them an email and say, hey, you're five minutes away from our restaurant or five minutes away from the Gap and send them blast emails. How do you see wearables, big data, these other technologies playing into that frequency? And do you see it being harmful, or how do you see that? The question, if you didn't hear it, was um, what about wearable technology? We can reach people with either email or you know, take it a step further. I'm an, I, I'm an Apple guy with iBeacon. Right? You could, in theory, know not just that I'm in Target, but I'm in the produce aisle. And it could send me an alert that I can get a dollar off of milk or uh, vegetables or something. Uh, Melvin Kranzberg was a famous professor at the was it Case Western University. He's got one of my all-time favorite quotes. He thought that there were six laws of technology. My favorite one is technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Right, so when I think about cell phones, in, in a way, it's an electron electronic leash. Right? We're like rats in a cage. Right? It's, just, it's natural for us to go to them. We touch our cell phones 150 times a day. That's more than we touch our faces. That's the bad news. The good news is, if you have kids, right, well, now the kid's got a cell phone. Where are you? I'm old enough to remember being lost and not knowing how to get to someone. So there's the potential for that. 
that gets into privacy areas, which scare the crap out of a lot of people. So yes, you can blast an email, and there's the potential to do that with big data. I'd argue that most organizations are really struggling, though. This is the reason that uh, publishers are struggling right now. They don't know who buys their books, right? How do they know? Amazon has a direct relationship with the customer. This is why Amazon's so valuable. You want to talk about big data, I could talk for hours about Amazon. Suffice it to say, they know exactly not only what people buy, but what people are inclined to buy. They, um, this is a great uh, fact. Last year, the company announced a pending patent on, get this, anticipatory shipping. That's just a fancy way of saying, I don't know what you're going to buy, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so I'm going to have something ready to you in two hours even though you haven't bought it yet. It's amazing what you can do with data, and I don't want to get off the subject here, but has anyone heard the story about Walmart, Pop-Tarts, and hurricanes? Great story. About 10 years ago, this is kind of legendary in, in the data management circles, but Walmart is, I think, the largest uh, private employer other than McDonald's in the country. They're right behind the federal government. So they generate a lot of business. Anyway, they discovered through their data mining that in the Midwest, when there was a hurricane warning, people went to Walmart, and I don't know why, and I don't think they know either, people would buy more Pop-Tarts, strawberry flavored, again, I don't know why, and beer. So they synced their inventory system up to the National Weather Service. So anytime there was a hurricane warning, their inventory systems would make sure they had extra strawberry Pop-Tarts and beer. So you can do amazing things with data. And, and even with email, it's um, in the last book, the visual organization, um, that company I mentioned before, Enron, a company bought a data set and modeled it. And they could actually mine the data, the text in email, and see that there was more of a, um, a warning because people were using words like risky or um, uncertain. So in theory, you can even do better things with email. I think you could do a lot more with these collaborative tools. But yes, in theory, you can reach exactly anybody you want. However, most companies are the anti-Amazon, the anti-Walmart. A friend of mine, Tony Fisher, wrote a book called The Data Asset, and in it, he showed the stat that it takes companies on average two weeks to get a comprehensive and accurate list of their customers. That's kind of scary. So there's a lot you can do with it. You just have to be careful about privacy. In fact, um, does everyone know the Target story about the woman? Some of you do, some of you don't. I'll, for those of you who don't know it, this is a great story. And Charles Duhigg, wrote about this in his book, Habit. It's a New York Times bestseller. Anyway, a guy storms into a Target in Minnesota, and he throws his marketing literature down on the manager's desk and goes, who the hell do you guys think you are? You're sending my 16-year-old daughter pregnancy information? She's as pure as the driven snow. How dare you? Now, the manager doesn't work in marketing. right? The manager goes, oh, gosh, sir, I'm sorry. It must have been a mistake, et cetera, et cetera. Two days later, the manager calls back, sir, we value as a customer, right? We want to make sure we didn't offend you. Guy goes, I owe you an apology. Turns out there were some things going on in my house that I didn't know about. So his daughter was pregnant. Target knew about it before he did. <laughs> so you can do some scary things with data. In fact, Target even, this is true, Target dumbs down its ads because it knows you so well that it would scare you with what you're getting. It will intentionally put in, uh, I know you don't like the, fan, the band Rush, we, we were talking about that before. It'll purposely put in Russia's new album, even though it has no interest to you, just so you don't think it's too creepy. So there are a lot of things you can do with data, and certainly understanding customers, I would argue, is a good thing. But publishers don't understand their customers, and they're really struggling right now. Amazon is so valuable. Apple's so valuable, in large part, because they know who buys their products. Google, look at Google Autocomplete. It's amazing to me. So you can do a lot with data.